invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter number two, which is our lectionary passage for this week. It is uh, the passage of scripture that for uh, many of us uh, may sound familiar. I, I've, I, I know I've preached this message or this passage before, but as I read through it this week, I found it even uh, not just appropriate, but I found it to be a lot more comforting <laughs> given the state of the world and the ways in which we are moving and struggling and trying to decipher our place, our role, and the activity of God in the world. Ephesians chapter number two, it is uh, a passage of scripture. If you take the, the, the context of this passage seriously, it is a passage that is attributed to uh, disciples or followers of the Apostle Paul uh, who helped to launch a church in what is called Ephesus. It would be uh, modern-day Asia, uh, right connected. Again, uh, one of the most interesting things about these conflicts happening in the Middle East and uh, the kind of region of Africa, Asia, is that you you lose sight that all of these uh, conflicts are happening literally in the holy lands of the early church written about for the last couple thousand years. And while there may be some who would like to take the biblical text and use it as a sole source of history, I want you and I to have a hermeneutic or a way to interpret scripture that uses it as a primary source of inspiration and guidance, right? That history, how many of you know, is greatly contested depending on who tells the story. Hello, somebody. How many know in your own life, your own history can be greatly contested depending on who tells your story? Anybody ever been in a relationship with someone or had a, a, a let, let's, let's leave the relationships alone. That may be a little too painful for us on a <laughs> Sunday morning. But anyone ever, ever, ever had a, a conflict with a friend? Even better, let's get even more specific. I remember we were uh, on the basketball court one time and, and, and we was playing ball and, 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 and I got fouled. And the person who fouled me was like, that's not a foul. And, uh, you know, the conversation moves from just a slight disagreement to a sharp conflict. And, uh, you know, over time, you know, I'm not saying me because I'm not petty like that. But the other person is like, you know, not willing to be in relationship related to playing basketball because they say you a cheater. You always cheating. But from my perspective, you always fouling. And so you got a fowler and a cheater, all at the same time, all in the same universe of the court. And it usually depends on who's telling that story. And the worst part is, if they go and try to recruit other people to believe who's a fowler and a cheater, there's another word I call that, and that's a hater. And so the moral of today's story is, don't be a fowler, a cheater, or a hater. Somebody say amen. But it is true that often much of this can be attributed to one's positionality in the story. Well, it is so important to appreciate that from the earliest times of Christ's sojourn here on earth, there has been and continues to be a host of descriptions, interpretations, sources of inspiration, but some folks also take scripture and turn it into something quite wicked. Uh -huh. And so our task is to make sure we are being formed in a way that turns us not into something more monstrous, but into something more divine, something more heavenly, something more righteous. And so in this passage of scripture, Ephesians chapter number two, we do see the apostle Paul's greatest hits as it is called all you know kind of combined into one text or one uh, uh, book of the of the uh, Christian scriptures that we call Ephesians the church in Ephesus 
the first churches being uh, established and extended in Asia Minor. And Ephesus was a great port. It was uh, a great entry point where people from all over the Roman Empire at that time would come and they would trade some of their greatest uh, creations. They were artisans. They were sculptors. They were uh, 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 we weavers of fine cloth and and spices. This was a major port. And so as this text is being read to us, I want you to appreciate that the writer is attempting to animate this idea of creation, of being the handiwork of God's hands. And that handiwork is us. So let's read and let's see what the scripture says for us as we move into our time of preaching. Verse number one, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. I believe this is this morning. The scripture simply says this. You were dead through trespasses and sins in which you once lived following the course of this world. Following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. Verse number three. All of us, everybody say all of us. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, just like everyone else. Verse number four, but God, everybody say, but God. God. Aren't you glad there's always a but God in your story, amen? But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love, with which God loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us up with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You always give your neighbor a high five and tell them, I see you going higher. Tell them that. I see you going higher. Verse number seven, so that in ages to come, God might show the immeasurable riches of God's grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse number eight, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not the result of your works. So no one may boast. Verse 10. For we are what God has made us. Created in Christ Jesus. For good works. Which God beforehand Prepare to be our way of life. The word of God for us, the people of God. Come on, let us say thanks be to God. All right, we're going to talk for a few moments simply from the topic, in God's hands. Now, you know, for a second, I was going to emphasize the question mark after the phrase in God's hands to see is this an inquiry that we should wrestle with. I'll let you decide if that's relevant for you. I want it to be declarative that we are in God's hands, but I also would love for you to think and ask yourself the question, am I in God's hands? Or whose hands am I in? Or whose hands are on me? A few questions for your contemplation. But let us pray. God, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we won't sin against you. And God, as we preach and teach your word, send your anointing that makes it all easy today. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Now, one of the great challenges of the Christ follower in today's context of not just faith, 
but also in life is to ask ourselves, which Jesus will we follow? Which faithful gospel will we subscribe to? How can we, in light of all that is around us, in light of all that we are confronting, how can we ensure that we are people who are following Jesus well? I can't help but continue to be reminded of Frederick Douglass's quote uh, written in the 1700s, and it is contextual, but it is worthy of our reflection, where Frederick Douglass says, I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slaveholding, women whipping, cradle plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Indeed, I can see no reason but the most deceitful one for calling the religion of this land Christianity. I look upon it as the climax of all misnomers, the boldest of all frauds, and the gro grossest of all libels. Frederick Douglass was on one that day, praise God. Frederick Douglass said, I'm tired of this church, amen. <laughs> Frederick Douglass was like, this church is whack. Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass was, 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 was letting some folk know that we who are trying to equate this very violent, abusive, dehumanizing expression of faith to the faith of Jesus are literally slandering the gospel. I mean, hundreds of years of this kind of critique can be lobbied against a certain kind or brand of faith. And yet, I often find it fascinating that while that critique is accurate and necessary, it need not be the description of all faith particularly as it relates to the kind of faith that is attempting to literally live into what we just talked about, a representation and following of the way of Jesus that embraces a sense of justice and activity of dechurchifying and certainly extending belonging, that there is a way to literally follow the ways of Jesus that will cause you to not be able to exist in a manner where violence and hegemony and hatred and malice can be attributed or extracted from your faith. Now, clearly, some of us love to make our behavior about other things rather than just about us. Anybody you know, be honest about how that person didn't make you do that. You just did it. <laughs> it's like, oh, they made me, oh, they made me still, oh, I don't know, you probably, oh, they made me cut you off, oh, I don't know, oh, they made me hit them, oh, I don't know. So maybe there's just some things inside of us that require our own work that are not necessarily attributed to a certain kind of ideological assumptions. I want you to believe, beloved, that as we grow as human beings, certainly as we grow in our relationship with God, there ought to be a certain formation. Dare I say transformation. Who you are today ought not be who you will be tomorrow. Who you are last year are not be who you are today. That you ought to be able to look back over your life and say, if it had not been for the Lord. I mean, I can look back and see, man, I used to be a piece of work back then. But now I'm just some work, praise God. I'm, 
I'm, I'm, I'm, I'm, I'm, I'm some work in progress, but I'm not like that piece of work that you used to look at and shake your head and be like, I don't know what we gonna do with that over there. As a matter of fact, I have found that when God's hands are on us, how I many know God can take what others discard and what others like to disqualify? God can shape you and I into something that is a masterpiece. And this is the gift, I believe, of this scripture and certainly of the context of this writing because you will find that the original listeners and readers of this text were certainly people who understood what it meant to have a masterpiece. To have something they were able to produce as an extension of God's divine giftedness to them. That God gives all of us something unique. God gives all of us something that is uh, your, your thumbprint, your, your, special, your special giftedness that cannot be duplicated or replicated. Certainly there may be other people around you who have a similar passion, but can you fully ascertain, beloved, that there's something about you that is unique? That when you show up on your job, when you show up in your family, when you show up in the neighborhood, that you may be often imitated or duplicated, but you are a, in and of yourself unique. The scripture says like this, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That there is no doppelganger that can fully inhabit who you are. There may be some folk who can remind them of you. Oh, you remind me of them. How do you know being reminded is not the same as being? Hello, somebody. Well, there is a very important kind of uh, uh, a truth in this passage that there is something that God wants to fashion us into. And you and I ought to take it very seriously that I and we are a work in progress in God's hands. Now, you ought to be mindful, beloved, that there are some other hands out there that will love to get their hands on you. There's some hands out there that got their hands on some of us right now. And they're shaping us. They are taking those parts of us that are unique. Those pains, those experiences, those, those challenges. And, and rather than unlocking the beauty of who you are, they are catalyzing the part of you that you know you want to keep buried. At least I hope you want to keep buried. There are some impulses, some ways of being. There are some, some ways we show up in the world that require a certain kind of checking, a certain kind of taming. Sometimes you got to put some of these things on lock in your life in order to allow the better part of you to shine through. Well, as we move closer and closer to Easter, I want to imagine that one of the great gifts that Jesus gives to us is that Jesus divinely poured into a human body, as we understand, God in the flesh, the fullness of God. Meaning, as much as you can get of God into human body, that's who Jesus was. Jesus was literally divinity locked into a human body. And yet, there were moments through the life of Jesus where he would just allow a little crack in his humanity to let the divinity shine through. Every time Jesus did a miracle, he was letting some of that divinity shine through. Every time Jesus saw something good in someone that no one else could see, he was letting that divinity shine through. Every time Jesus taught messages to thousands of people and penetrated their hearts in ways 
that they would say, we've never heard anyone speak like this. And Jesus was allowing the crack in his humanity to allow divinity. Every time he fed thousands of people with a few fishes and some loaves. Every time Jesus moved in a way that penetrated the humanity of others in their brokenness, Jesus was allowing his divinity to peek through. And beloved, I want you to know you have that same power. Are you hearing me this morning? That there's something divine about you. Lord, I wish I could talk to somebody who understood what I was saying. There's something divine. There's something uniquely constituted about how God has put you together. And there are all kinds of ways that you and I need to make sure that, God, if you are putting me together, how can I stay in your hands? How can I cooperate with how you are forming me? and shaping me, and healing me, and restoring me, because quiet as it's kept, it is our cooperation with the hands of God, the active hands of God, that will turn us into something more divine. God needs we who follow God to be divine in the earth. Yes, yes. God does not need any more death dealing, war mongering, oppressive, hateful people naming the name of God in the world. God don't need that. I bet you God be up in heaven like, I don't know what these folks do with what I left behind. <laughs> we didn't read the part that said, love your neighbor as yourself. Where, where they get this killing your neighbor? Where they, where they get that? I, I, you know, I, 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 and some folks say, oh, well, you know, that's all in the Bible. Yes, they, there are historical records. But I think it's really important to keep appreciating that when you read the scripture with the ark of Jesus as your interpretive lens, you can literally see how Jesus is coming to correct yeah. the arc yeah. of interpretation. That's why we call ourselves followers of Jesus. We ain't just followers of the Bible. Oh, I'm just following the Bible. Well, I follow Jesus. And as Jesus leads me, I will follow I remember Bishop Noah Jones, he had this very funny way of talking about interpretation. He said, uh, a, a brother was praying one time. He said, I, I just want to, I just want to, you know, just follow. I just want to follow whatever the word says. So he said, I, I'm just going to open up my scripture and, 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 and I'm just going to follow whatever the scripture tells me to do. So this fellow takes his Bible. You know, this when we still have Bibles, not like, you know, internet Bibles where you, you know, have pages. So it could feel random. Somebody say, man. I'm going to take my random page Bible. I'm just going to open it. And the first verse that he read said, uh, uh, every word of God is true. He said, ooh, Lord, I thank you. This is a good word. Came back the next day, and the scripture said, Judas went and hung himself. He said, hmm. I don't know what that's trying to tell me, but one out of two ain't bad. <laughs> and he came back the third day, and the scripture said, go and do thou likewise. <laughs> and he said, hmm, I need a new interpretive <laughs> process. How many of you know, while that may sound ridiculous, Many of us use that kind of randomized interpretive process, not just in scripture, but in a lot of our lives. We just take everything as it comes without discernment, without a filter, 
And if we're going to remain in the hands of God, there are several things I want to lift up. The first thing is you and I, according to this passage today, must check our influences. If I and we are going to stay in the hands of God, we ought to check our influences. The first thing the text says that we were once dead through the trespasses and the sins in which we once lived following, listen, the course of this world, the ideas of this world, the sensibilities of this world, that there are many kinds of influences in our lives that require our ability to check them. Check the sources. Check who is behind this information, this thing that is literally shaping and forming me in ways that are passive and active. In the age of social media, how many of you know that there is a very important conversation we must have with our children, dare I say with ourselves, about how we discern what is true and what is manufactured? There are lots of messages being sent our way that have a, a spirit of deception attached to them. Meaning they're trying to get you and I confused about something that ought not be confusing. <laughs> Hello, somebody. It ought not be confusing that there are literally genocides and, and, and ethnic cleansing and mass death events happening in our world, and you and I ought to be people who are not confused about that when we see it. Folk would love to make you and I think that there's a reason why it, all, it is okay for people to die. I'm gonna start locally. There are people who are caught in cycles of violence, conflicts, and there are people in our own region who believe that if they die, that's just good for the rest of us. I can't tell you how many messages I get from all kind of folk, woke folk, sleep folk, religious folk, agnostic folk, politicians, preachers, who believe that if the problems of our region related to crime and related to violence are to be solved, it can only be solved by us gathering up everybody who's guilty. However, and I said, well, how are you going to gather them up? Oh, we, I mean, what do you mean? Just, just gather them up. I said, really? I'd love to just, I, I want to understand how that project happens. And what do you do with people when you gather them up? I mean, listen to the language that we're using and many of the, 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 the folks who are, 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 are down with a program of gathering people up so they can feel safe. Don't fully appreciate that there are so many individuals who've been victimized long before they become a perpetrator. That if all of our strategies are about throwing people away, what will happen when your trauma pushes you to a place where you now qualify for being thrown away? Or, you know, we're struggling with the conflict in Israel-Palestine, and, and we're watching the mass death, and we're watching depending on who you are politically, all kind of folk who are trying to excuse what we see. I heard someone say, this is a just war. I said, a just war. Again, a just war is a theological framework created by Christians who wanted to make sense of why it's okay to kill people in a war context. And I want you to know, beloved, that while it is true we live in a violent and fallen world, none of us should be okay the death of anyone. This is what an impulse of scripture says. And so whether it's at home in a neighborhood or whether it's abroad in another country, we must be people 
who are not being influenced to make excuses for death. And I want you to know, beloved, there's a lot of death going on in the world. A lot of us are some walking dead folk. A lot of us, we, 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 we're not the, the kind of folk who are literally out taking the lives, but we're certainly willing to be complicit silently. And so my question for you and I around this checking our influences is, who or what informs you the most about the things that you are concerned about the most? Who informs you? What informs you? What is your process of getting to a decision about how and where you will show up in the world related to issues of life and death? related to issues of generosity, related to issues of healing. What influences you the most? And can you make space for a God-inspired influence? Something that ensures that I am not going to be wedded to the spirit of this world that loves to make excuses for death and destruction and oppression, but I'm going to appeal to a higher authority. A higher authority that many of us must seek out regularly. I want you to know, beloved, just because you come to church doesn't necessarily mean you're seeking out that higher authority. It's a good place to start for the most part, generally. Sometimes. Because <laughs> if you're in a church that's trying to make sense of death, you ought to leave that church. If you're in a, in a community that's trying to make you feel like that uh, we're going to have poverty and violence with us always. So you should just build your picket fence around your house and not worry about the stewarding of creation. You ought to question that form of discipleship. Why? Because God has you in God's hand so you can be a catalyst wherever you are. And that's why the second point is so important for us, because there is a great gift of God's activity in our life, and it's called grace and mercy. Ah. Ooh, somebody holler grace. grace. Somebody holler mercy. Grace. The scripture says that you need a graceful makeover. Yeah. That you and I who were dead in our sins, but for the grace of God. You would have remained dead. How many know that grace is God's active infusing of love and kindness in your life? Grace is when God says, I see you how you are, but I'm going to put something inside of you that will start to change you from the inside out. It's not because you did a bunch of good works. No, it's because there's something that God has placed inside of you that is literally regenerating you from the inside out. Grace is God's gift to us. Grace filled makeover. Theologically, whenever I like to talk about grace, I always like to talk about mercy. Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. Mm-hmm. I remember when we used to go to the court, standing up for the kids, and I used to go in there all the time, hollering for them kids. They didn't do it! This old racist system, standing before the judges, just, just, and then, you know, they showed me some evidence, them on video. <laughs> <laughs> and I look at this knucklehead, I'd be like, why you got me out here like this, bruh? I'm still like that. I, 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 I have a soft spot in my heart for a hard case. I, I got to see with my own eyes to believe most folk is guilty of almost anything. But now in my 48 years of life, 20-some years of ministry, I don't ask folk if they did it. <laughs> I just cry out for mercy. <laughs> Aren't you glad that God gives you mercy? God, don't be out here asking, you, did you do it? God knows you did it. <laughs> but God still gives you what? Mercy. Why is mercy needed? Because you're going to need a second chance to do it better the next time. Mercy is God's way of preserving our lives. Mercy is God's way of making sure that the door does not 
close on the potentiality of who God created you to be. Mercy is you getting a chance to make a mistake and stay in the land of the living. Mercy. Grace is when God gives you something that you could not ever repay. You don't qualify for God's grace. God's grace is the act of God's generosity pouring out into your life. That's why the scripture says we are saved by grace. You're not saved by what you do. Who you are, who your family is, how many mistakes you've made, how many degrees you got, how rich you are, because none of that, when it's added all up, can even approach the amazing grace of God. God's grace is lavishly poured out on you. And when you get that lavish grace of God poured into you and out on you, you start to change into something more lovely, something more faithful, something more hopeful. Why? Because it is literally God's abundance poured out into you. And when you get a graceful makeover, you won't stay the same. When you get a graceful makeover, you won't act the same. When you get a graceful makeover, you will find yourself responding to the same situation with a different kind of grace. How many know when I get access to grace, I can then extend grace to somebody else? It's hard for me to be judgmental when I know that God is not judging me. It's hard for me to be violent when I know God is not violent with me. It's hard for me to be hateful when I know God is not a hater on me. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him I thank God for some grace. And I want you to know, child of God, that it is the grace of God. That appears to all humanity that brings us salvation. And when you can be someone who moves through the grace of God, then the last point I'll say today is it positions you then to do good work. Somebody holler, do some good work. I want you to know, child of God, that it's so important for you to keep telling and reminding yourself that when I'm in the hands of God, everything that I produce must have life attached to it. I cannot be in God's hands uh, and reproduce death. Uh, mm, You ought to give yourself a little bit of a pat on the chest and say, I'm not a death dealer. uh, But wherever I am, I'm going to put in some good work. Somebody holler good work. Good work is more than the commodification of your giftedness. Uh, Good work is more than the busyness of your daily schedule. Uh, Good work is more than you just running from goal to goal and place to place uh, with elevation and with accolades. Uh, Good work is when you can do something uh, that is natural, but with the infusing of God's spirit, uh, you can penetrate the brokenness uh, of your coworker. Uh, of your family, uh, of your neighbor. Somebody holler good work. Uh, Good work is when God can take that natural gift uh, that you thought could only be used uh, on your job, in the academy, on the block. uh, And God can take that natural gift uh, and start to elevate you uh, into heavenly places. Somebody holler good work. Uh, Good work is when you can see a need and feel it uh, uh, without feeling like you are exhausted and without what you need. Somebody holler, good work. Uh, Good work is when you can, through the grace of God, uh, begin to see with eyes of faith uh, that the thing that the devil thought would destroy me uh, has actually made me stronger. Uh, Somebody holler, good work. Uh, Good work is when you can look at your child uh, and say, I know you're struggling right now, uh, but I can see you through the eyes of faith uh, and say, who you are today is not who you will be tomorrow. I can look at my partner. I can look at my neighborhood. I can look at myself and say because I'm connected to God God's going to do some good work. God's going to bring life. God's going to bring resurrection. God's going to bring hope. God's going to bring healing. I'm talking about good work. And this is why I love it when it says, please be patient with me. Because God 
is not through with me yet. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him God's not through with you. You in the hands of God. So don't get weary about what you see with your eyes. Look through the eyes of God's grace. Because when God gets through, when God gets through with you, beloved, you coming forth as pure gold, as a shiny masterpiece, as a creation of the most divine God. Come on, stand with us, everybody. Let's take a few moments to pray and be reminded. That God, I want to be in your hands. I want to be someone who is regularly advocating for that which you love. Peace, joy, love, healing, hope. And I need to be honest, God, that there are moments where my influences are pulling me away from that. So God, I want to check these influences. God, I need grace. Whew. I need a lot of grace. I need a lot of mercy. I need a makeover. I need to be made over into your image and your likeness. I need to first believe, God, that there's grace for me that's available. That my circumstance and situation does not disqualify me from your grace. Somebody say, I'm worthy of the grace. Come on, say it again. I'm worthy of God's grace. And I want to put in good work. Grab the hand of someone next to you or touch them, their elbow, their shoulder. Just make a quick human connection. God, I'm praying for the person I'm touching today. I'm praying, God, because I see them. I see the power that you've created them to be. And I don't want to take for granted today that they are conscious of this power, of this grace. But I pray, God, that you will make them into a magnificent masterpiece. God, the, the potential is there because you've given it to all of us. But God, bless the one I'm touching. Give hope, healing, and strength to the one I'm touching. May they know that their best is yet to come. May they know that as they advocate for peace and healing, peace and healing is coming into their life. May they be agents of reconciliation, agents, oh God, of hope and strength and second chances, and may it spread to every part of their life. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Lift those hands right where you're standing. God, I pray for my own circumstance. It's me, oh Lord, and I'm standing right here in the need of prayer. Touch me. Somebody say, touch me, Lord. Save me. Somebody say, save me, Lord. Heal me. Somebody say, heal me, Lord. Heal me, God, from the death, from the disappointment, from the abuse, from the trauma, from the isolation, the loneliness, the depression. Lord God, the hurt, the harm, the pain, heal me, God, and I will be healed. I know that you are a healer. I know that you can remake me into something beautiful. Do it in the name of Jesus. My hands are lifted and my heart is open to the remaking power of your spirit. God, I pray for salvation I pray, God, that you will extend grace and mercy to your people today and do it in a way that is undeniable. And we'll say, thank you, Lord. We'll say, thank you, Lord. We'll say, thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Come on, give a person a high five. Give them a handshake. Give them a hug and tell them we're in God's hands. Come on, tell them that we're in God's hands. We're in God's hands. We're in God's hands. Come on, if you believe that today, clap your hands and let's just thank the Lord. Come on, let's just thank the Lord. I thank you, God, that I'm in your hands. I thank you, God, that you're not through with me. 
I thank you, God, that healing and hope and help is coming because I'm in your hands. Oh, bless the name of God. We love you with the love of the Lord today.